Kia ora. Welcome to the Health and Wellbeing Stream for the afternoon. I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation as the traditional custodians of the land where I am today. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and future for they hold the memories, traditions, culture and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of Australia. I extend that respect to all First Nations people in the session today. So we have four very interesting presentations coming up. So I will keep give each speaker to their 20 minutes. And if time is available at the end of each presentation, I'll ask um, questions from the Q&A. So I'll just remind you, if you can put the questions in the Q&A and any statements or discussion in the discussion section, um, that would be um, make it easier for me to identify those questions. So moving straight on, our, our first speakers uh, today, uh, Melanie O'Connell, the Manager Youth Operations with Women and Young People Directorate of the Department of Justice, Corrective Western Australia. Melanie is a passionate and committed youth justice drives to improve outcomes for all young people involved in the justice system. And Melissa Zampati is the Senior Project Officer with the Women and Young People Directorate of Department of Justice, Corrective Services, WA. And she has a particular interest in the area of youth mental health and innovative ways to improve outcomes for young people involved in the justice system. So I'd like to welcome Melanie and Melissa, who are going to present on lessons learned to FASD awareness in WA Youth Justice Services. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Firstly, we'd like to start by uh, saying acknowledgement. The Department recognises the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them and their cultures and to elders, both past and present. We also wish to acknowledge traditional custodians of the land which we are meeting on, which is the Watch Up people, and acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and contribution to my, uh, they bring to make this life, this city, and this region. We also acknowledge and pay respects to the Nairihi Māori, Whenua of Aurora, Namihi, Namihi, Namihi. Welcome to our presentation. It's on a lessons learned approach to FASD in WA Youth Justice Services. Due to time constraints, we will be pushing through the slides fairly quickly. However, we'll, we'll make our presentation available following um, the conference. Thank you. Okay. Um, as part of the Youth Justice Services business area, within WA, we work with the state's most disadvantaged and challenging young people. The primary focus is to keep the community safe, divert young people from the justice system and reduce reoffending through the provision of programs and services. The portfolio of youth justice in WA includes 11 primary community-based centres and 12 sub-centres. One juvenile detention facility um, named Banshee Hill Detention Centre which holds a maximum of 200 capacity beds. A youth justice psychological services, a metropolitan youth bail service, court services, which includes a court assessment treatment support team who service the drug court, and a links team who provides support for mental health services via the court. And lastly, youth justice programs within the community and in custody to address identified criminogenic needs. In two, 2020 to 2021, Youth Justice were responsible for the management of an average of 102 youth detainees in Bankshire Hill Detention Centre and 1,151 young people in the community statewide per day. As a FASD is a lifelong disability with individuals having strengths and weaknesses. Diagnosis include uh, three of the 10 domains um, to be considered impaired in addition to confirmed maternal alcohol consumption. We heard from TKI yesterday, um, however, through the screening and diagnostic assessment, TKI um, conducted a prevalent study in Bankshire Hill and found that 36% of those assessed were diagnosed with FASD and 89% had at least one domain of severe neurodevelopmental impairment. 
The prevalence study itself has shaped the progression of FASD throughout the initiation of the dialogue between the state, national and cross-border jurisdictions to consider how we identify and environmentally and therapeutically engage and support young people with FASD in the justice system. Additionally, it's driven our department's reflection and responsibility as to how do we as a justice agency build capacity to revise practices and policies and navigate through the abundance yet limited information to improve into individual outcomes of young people. Simply, TKI's prevalence study has necessitated a learning that young people diagnosed with FASD require interventions and supports that consider their brain functions. We know that with the appropriate diagnosis, interventions and supports, uh, with the, that without the appropriate diagnosis, interventions and supports, that risk increase for the young person, which ultimately increase the risk, uh, increases the need for us to mitigate um, these, particularly within custodial settings. WA has made concerted efforts to learn and to, to progress within the realm of FASD. And whilst we as a department progress and evolve in this space, the lessons learned through this voyage highlights the local and jurisdictional pathway forward. Overall, the TKI prevalence study provided the department with the ability to refine and strengthen practices in the establishment of dedicated structures for research governance and accountability to achieve sustainable outcomes for the justice system. Responsive relationships between TKI, the Department and the West Australian Office of Crime Statistics and Research saw the capacity building of these business areas and also the consideration and implementation of ethical and reliable controls for data release. The navigation of complex processes around confidentiality for both the Department and Health Department has informed the implementation of risk management strategies which in effect have enabled data governance to date. Moving on from the TKI research, the department is mindful the data has now expired and learnings from the study is compromised by time. The cohort, culture and complexities of young people in Bankshire Hill Detention Centre remain varied. Whilst the research envisaged the development of a FASD screening tool, a neurological screening tool was then later proposed by TKI as an alternative best option. Operationally, working with part of the picture is likely not to give the best outcomes for the individual. It is un undetermined whether a gen general neurological screening tool could initiate possible indicators required for a phase T diagnosis. Due to the varied cohort of young people in the justice system since the research, there may be future lessons learned, learned relating to the need for a FASD screening tool, albeit the diagnostic capability by the department is limited by the health professionals which inform it. Currently, and in the absence of both a neurological or a FASD screening tool, the department is at liberty um, of the courts in order to order the FASD assessment. <laughs> The current court process is the only juncture in which a young person can be referred for a FASD assessment and following assessment, there are impacts across the department in the ability to navigate post-assessment supports. With a number of service providers contracted by the department for completion of assessments, there is a reliance on departmental to staff to inform family of the reports for finding supports and navigate the MBIS process. With the have a Justice Lives Officer at the Perth Metropolitan Children's Court. This is added to a smaller thing, however, does not capture the statewide service provision. Within, with the courts becoming further informed and investing in FASD assessments to improve outcomes for young people before the court, we've seen movements in the sentencing of young people. As shown in this slide, there has been approximately 188 FASD reports completed in WA since 2018. This is in comparison to an average of over a thousand young people who have presented before the Children's Court statewide per year, which denotes the number of young people who are not referred for assessments. The potential risk here is in the absence of a FASD assessment. Behaviours are often overlooked as being delinquent rather than reflective of their unmet needs as a consequence of their unknown diagnosis. 
investing in collaboration with government and non-government agencies to determine who is best placed to navigate the identification for and progress assessment referrals of young people with a possible FASD diagnosis and at what juncture should be prioritised. Since 2019, the department has been involved in a cross-agency FASD working group to consider how best to coordinate existing resources for FASD across government. Progress for this department in advancing its assigned action of sharing FASD assessment information across government and with families has been impacted by identified legislative barriers to the sharing of court ordered neurological reports. As such, the department is currently reviewing relevant legislation uh, simultaneously rather than a st standalone amendment. The resourcing demands of the department to facilitate FASD assessments are a vast spatial area of WA. To coordinate the many specialists to meet with a young person, caregivers and relevant stakeholders is often challenged by the logistics, time, access, travel, funding and availability of the specialists of a diagnostic team. Whilst the department overcome these challenges with commitment and lengthy court remands, the FASD assess assessments being completed at an early interjection of a young person's life, prior to them becoming to the attention of the judicial system, can alleviate these challenges and also benefit the young person. In the absence of, of earlier assessments through joint cross-government commitment, a FASD screening tool that is culturally appropriate, accessible and applicable statewide would also contribute to the redistribution of resources and assist in the earlier interventions for young people to identify their needs and open pathways for target supports. In addition to the challenges in having assessed with young people, the Department are widely aware of the additional barriers which is the availability of services to support young people with a diagnosis of FASD across the state. Where key government and non-government agencies are predominantly based in the Perth metropolitan area, service deliver delivery in regional and remote WA is limited to fly in, fly out, drive in and drive out capacities. From a case management lens, the department have committed to the facilitation of training statewide for all youth justice staff that are at a local level to develop capacity to impart knowledge and work effectively as possible in the absence of the myriad of supports young people often require. Where supports are offered on a rotational capacity, there is often minimal gains in working with the young person and family due to time and travel constraints. The onus then becomes reliant on the existing services such as education, police and health to entrust that they are imparted with the appropriate knowledge to provide the support required. Through purposeful and meaningful relationship building, there's been some successes for young people outside of the Perth metropolitan area. However, with the identification for assessments to be done at the most appropriate juncture and by who, will provide a strategic basis for improving service delivery, resourcing and capacity building that is required. As you can see on this slide, um, this is the current cohort. It's a snapshot of raw data that was captured on one day at one point in time um, in October. This raw data highlights that FASD continues to have the relevance and have relevance in the custody setting, and there is a continual need for FASD learnings to underpin the ongoing service delivery within the community and um, within custody. <laughs> There has been thank you. There has been a note of behavioural change in practice and culture, has grown positively since 2018 and is demonstrated demonstrated in the staff commitment for the development and implementation of a specialised intensive supervision unit and the delivery of targeted care for young people with complex multi multiple morbidity, uh, morbidity needs. The ITU case management assessment process to inform the immediate care of young people admitted with high risk functioning impairment, complex trauma and mental health needs. The de development of a weekly superintendent intensive support unit multidisciplinary team. The development of the, a girls precinct MDT to inform the care of young females. The streaming, streamlining of uh, the streaming of education to match the assessed functional learning needs and the introduction of ongoing reviews from multidisciplinary services within the Bank Health Detention Centre. 
we are being told that where time is ticking down very quickly. So we're just going to um, yeah, just in terms of the um, uh, success for uh, in terms of our psychological programs, there's been a particular shift in um, the pedagogy to ensure that all teaching opportunities are capitalised with the strategies recommended in meeting individual and group needs who have confirmed or positive bad diagnosis. So whilst there has been a substantial investment in building workforce capacity and responding to young people with SD, there is additional training in trauma informed practices across youth justice. From the field has been a um, that of mixed messaging and confusion is expectation is to operate in a trauma-informed manner or a phase D manner, whether the two interplay or if different needs are needed to be made, depending on whether the phase D informed or phase D informed. With these queries, it's identified the strategic planning of how training is facilitated, holistically informed practices to meet with greater service delivery needs, Various synergies have learned through the department and common themes have been a need for consistent messaging, a recognised and accepted source of information and collaboration and connections in multi-sector partnerships at a national, state local and cultural organisations and non-government level. So I think we'll um, thank everyone now um, for your time. Again, there is a wealth of information within this package, so we will make it available to uh, those who are interested. Over to you, Mandy. Mm, fantastic. Thank you. Um, the Mills. I'm, I'm calling uh, the Mills. Um, it, it, um, <laughs> yeah, just just really well highlighted the challenges in regards to assessments. Just then, also the access once you assess somebody, um, access to supports. So great to see all that work. Um, obviously, coming from that research back in twenty eighteen. Um, any That's right. anybody have any questions? There's nothing in the Q and A yet. Yeah. One of, one of my questions is um, there was a section in there about speech pathologist services. Do you actually have speech pathologists within W, like within um, Youth Justice or are they external services? They're external services. Um, they come in and detention facility. Um, so we hold the remand and sentence young people all within the one space um, and they frequent the centre twice a week. So there's obviously mm -hmm. so they're they're um they're fun service you're just inviting them into the centres. Absolutely yes yes and we welcome them um, with open arms <laughs> Oh yeah, we'd, we'd welcome um, free pathology as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Look, and, and, thank um, you. Thanks that's, very much. That's probably a great segue into our next um, speaker. So I will thank um, Melanie and Melissa for that, that very interesting presentation and I'm, I'm keen to actually find out a bit more about how um, the FASD assessments and processes work in WA. Um, so, yes, as I said, a good segue into our next presenter, um, Mary Woodward. And Mary's a UK-trained speech pathologist with extensive experience working in the forensic and psychiatric systems. Since moving to Australia in 2011, she has advocated strongly for recognition and management of communication and swallowing needs of people accessing mental health and justice services, including the benefit of speech pathologists and intermediaries. Um, I've spent a, a lot of time talking to Mary about her, um, you know, her advocacy for um, speech pathologists linked to um, youth justice. 
So Mary is here today to present on something you can't afford to miss. Thank you very much, Mandy. Um, so I'm coming to you today, oh, I'm coming to you today from the beautiful northern beaches of Sydney. And I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands, seas and waters throughout Australia and pay my respects to elders past, present and future. At Speech Pathology Australia, we recognise that the health and social and emotional well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are grounded in continued connection to culture, country, language and community and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. I'd also like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the people of the land in New Zealand, Namihi Kiakoto. I hope I pronounced that right. So my first few slides are going to be just a very whistle-stop tour of the background of why we wanted to do this study and why it was important. Um, it's been exhilarating to see so many presentations um, already in the conference about the um, the neuro uh, neuro disabilities and the communication needs of so many young people in the justice system and people with fantastic solutions as to how some of those needs can be better supported. Um, but if just in case people have missed some of those presentations, I'll just do a very quick um, uh, background. I could talk about this for, for hours and hours and hours. So apologies that it's going to be very fast <laughs> and then I'll get to the, the, the newer GC stuff. Um, so speech, language and communication is kind of an umbrella heading for various skills that are involved in being able to understand and express and share a message with someone else. So attention and listening skills, receptive, so understanding, expressive language, and that, that could be in writing or um, orally. Speech, so the actual pronunciation of words, voice, fluency, so how much you stumble and, and mumble and stutter, and prosody, so the intonation, the melody of your speech and also social communication and interaction, the pragmatic language skills. And they all fall under the speech, language and communication heading. So when people have needs, quite often nowadays you hear the term speech, language and communication needs, so SLCN, and they, they, that could be difficulties in any or all of speech, language and communication skills. Um, so I won't say, I won't go into any of these in great depth, more than happy to talk to people um, off the air about it. it may, someone may have expressive language difficulties, they may have receptive language difficulties, higher level language difficulties, so that's difficulties with abstract language or social uh, sort of inferencing, etc. Voice disorders, uh, speech disorders, so difficulties with the actual articulation of the speech sounds, difficulties using language socially, um, so pragmatic language difficulties, um, that can also include difficulties understanding or using nonverbal communication. Um, and of course, it can also include literacy difficulties, which is obviously just the written form of language. Um, when people are thinking about, well, how do we know if someone's got speech, language and communication needs, particularly in young people um, who, for all sorts of reasons, are often very highly skilled at masking their difficulties. Um, they may, or may not, but they may have diagnoses already or, or other things that may just be a red flag for you to suggest that they, they are likely to have speech, language and communication needs. For example, if they have a known acquired brain injury, um, an autism spectrum disorder, some form of mental illness, developmental language disorder, um, a history of adverse childhood experiences, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, hearing loss, intellectual disability, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, for example. All of those could be red flags. And of course, that's not an exhaustive list. Um, the prevalence in the general population of SLCN is between 10 and 20%. In the youth justice population, um, the kind of conservative estimate from, from research, and this is research in Australia, including um, with Mandy in youth justice in New South Wales, but across Australia and internationally, is between 40 and 60 percent. And I say conservative because um, obviously in research there's a lot of exclusionary criteria um, that would mean that we don't necessarily capture everyone who has um, speech language and communication is just because of the methodology of the research. So 
I think most people who work with this population would agree that um, that the, the estimates that we get through the research are underestimates. Particularly, you know, we know that in youth mental health and in out of home care, for example, the, the prevalence of speech language and communication needs is more like 80 percent. And obviously there's lots of common comorbidities um, and those sorts of conditions are uh, overrepresented in the justice system. So I think we can probably safely say that it's more like 80 percent and some would argue that it's more than that. We also know that the social determinants of health have a profound impact on language de development. Um, with research suggesting that coming from situations of social disadvantage puts children at an increased risk of having additional SLCNs, so speech, language and communication needs. These children start school about two years behind in their oral language skills, which then impacts on their ability to learn and to engage in the educational system and the process and to read and write, because oral language is fundamental to um, acquiring literacy. So that in turn then has a negative impact on their later academic success um, and their later oral language, because you initially learn to read, but then you read to learn, and their later employment. So basically, early communication difficulties have a cumulative compounding effect. Not expecting to be able to, to see this, but this is a, a diagram shared with us by a, a UK colleague uh, based on a model originally proposed by um, Karen Bryan in, in England. It's just helpful to, to link SLCN with offending behaviour in terms of um, how, um, how the risks compound. But I say I won't go into it in great depth because I want to get on to the, the meatier stuff. So the impact of speech, language and communication needs um, are that they can impact on people's daily interactions on their social relationships and ability particularly to form positive social networks and their behavior and you know, i think everyone knows now that um behavior that can be seen as rude or challenging etc can often be um masking or can often be the kind of symptom if you like with the cause being um speech language and communication needs academic outcomes as i've already sort of mentioned um employment outcomes it has significant impacts for, for forensic interviewing and accessing um, the courts, as you, some of you may have heard in the panel with Casey Tyler um, and co yesterday afternoon. Um, has an impact on, on capacity, competence and fitness assessments, conflict resolution, restorative justice on family group conferences, for example, as we, as we heard from Elaine McKee this morning, um, and on people's ability to engage in intervention programmes. So one of the, the things that would be great, <laughs> as Mandy has already alluded to, is if there were more speech pathologists. Woo. Um, there's a lot that, that can be done by everybody working in the system, but speech pathologists are, are in my opinion, a, a crucial um, factor in that. And speech pathologists would come and would do assessments, would help to contribute to, di to differential diagnoses, would advise um, and work collaboratively with um, the rest of the staff and with um, the young people themselves in terms of um, working on, on goals, etc. We would work in at different levels. I don't know if people are familiar with the response to intervention framework. Um, so we would do some universal interventions, for example, um, um, triaging speech, language and communication needs, um, identifying um, uh, strengths and difficulties, adapting content, um, sorry, adapting content and wording of verbal and written material, consultative modelling, etc., education and collaboration, um, all the way through to, to tier three, which is those specialist interventions where you might do more in-depth um, 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 assessments and delivering one-to-one -one potentially therapeutic um, interventions to help develop someone's communication skills based on their goals, their individual goals. This is all wonderful. So where are all the speech pathologists? Uh, we, everyone I speak to and everyone I, I meet through my advocacy now seems to recognise the, the need and potential benefit of speech pathologists. Um, the common answer we get is, ah, oh, but there isn't enough money and you know, we've got budget issues, etc. And don't get me wrong, I fully appreciate that there are 
um, significant budget issues. It's not like there's an endless pot of money. But in my, we thought, well, hang on a second, I'm pretty sure that in the long run, it would actually save money if you have speech pathologists. Um, so that's what we wanted to set out to investigate. Was this just a kind of our biased opinion or not? So in order to get the best and most accurate information we could, we commissioned um, the Intellectual Disability Behaviour Support Programme, particularly Anne Douse, um, at the University of New South Wales. And she um, led a project in collaboration with UTS. Um, the aim being to investigate the life course impact of speech pathology intervention for people with SLCN who were at risk of contact already in the criminal justice system and to explore the economic benefits of these interventions. The outcome of, of our commissioning was this report, and I'll show you later a link to how to actually access the, the full report, because obviously um, uh, there isn't time to go through it all now. What they did for us was um, a substantial, thorough literature review to try and draw together what was known and what was unknown in this space. Then they did a regression analysis um, and they estimated the probabilities and expected frequencies of criminal justice outcomes for people with SLCN who either did or did not receive an intervention. And they looked at four different points in the life course of, the, of an individual. So point number one was before any antisocial behaviour in youth, so early childhood before any antisocial behaviour. Then we had, okay, so they've engaged in some form of antisocial behaviour, but they haven't actually had contact with youth justice yet. Then, okay, so they've had contact with um, youth justice, but they haven't yet um, re-offended, for example. And then the final um, uh, life point was as an adult. So assuming that they've been missed throughout their um, contact with youth justice, what happens if they get intervention as an adult? Next, they um, created a decision analytical model to compare the cost of intervention versus the cost of not intervening. And they used um, three separate models of intervention. I should, say, I should say that the when we're talking about the cost of intervening or not intervening, that's the cost to the justice system and the community. Um, obviously, there's an awful lot of, of um, qualitative um, costs of offending or not offending as well. Um, so yes, based on the response to intervention that I mentioned earlier, whereby different tiers of service represent different service intensities. It was it had to be split according to those levels of intervention for uh, methodological purposes. In reality, a speech pathologist would work across all three levels of, of that. It, it, uh, an effective speech pathology service wouldn't be to come in and just do one-on-one -on -one therapy or just do the consultative therapy, for example, to actually get real bang for buck, you'd want to do all three. So the slight artificial, uh, slightly artificial how I'm about to present the results, but you, know, you get the idea. Um, so what they discovered was speech pathology that um, led to a reduction in SLCN, and they were looking at a fairly conservative um, reduction in difficulties. So only one standard deviation is difficult, uh, different. So they're looking at okay, so if the intervention reduced someone's needs from two standard deviations below the norm to one standard deviation below the norm, so just that one standard deviation, which there's a lot of evidence for for speech pathology being able to um, um, increase people's skills. If that intervention had that um, outcome, um, would that decrease risks of antisocial behaviour and offending behaviour? And yes, yes, it would. <laughs> and obviously, um, antisocial and offending behaviour are the things that I mean having contact with justice services. The modelling also found that the earlier intervention occurred, the greater the cumulative benefit in terms of how much public money would be, could be saved. But most importantly, how much would be saved for the, the person themselves with better life trajectories um, being indicated by having better communication skills. So people who have had the benefit of speech pathology intervention are then more likely to go on to get a job themselves and thus become a positive, a positive economic influence as opposed to having those negative, that negative impact. So basically, um, uh, oh yes, 
sorry, should have clicked then. So basically providing people with speech pathology is a win-win-win. It's a win to the individual, a win to the justice system with better rehab outcomes, and a win to the community as a whole with cost savings at every level. Lots and lots of figures here. There's even more figures in the actual report. Um, and I, I'm not going to read them all out, but basically they, they um, uh, looked at the different costs that could be um, saved per individual and so obviously you can extrapolate from that the the cost savings if it was applied to a whole service and a whole population at different points in someone's um um life so oh, there we go so as you'll see there's greater savings um um sort of greater bang for your buck at that earlier intervention but there's still um very good um cost savings um Sorry, my watch is speaking to me greater cost savings even if um, speech pathology occurs in adult custody um and as i say this is per individual and it's slightly artificial breaking it down into these three tiers um but at least it hopefully makes the point that um even though it costs to employ a speech pathologist in the long run you'll actually save a lot more um have i got time shall i do shall i give you a quick whistle stop for tim no because i know that there's um question and answers. So there are some case studies in the, the report. I'll say I'll direct you to the report in a minute. Um, so if you want to see them applying to a fictional, a couple of fictional um, case studies in terms of the cost savings for a sort of typical, if you like, um, individual um, who's engaged in the justice system and what that actually looks like if intervention had been received at different points in his life. Um, you can find all of that in a report. So in terms of, oh, oh, what have I done? In terms of finding information, if you go to the Speech Pathology Australia website, which is here, if you, you'll arrive at the home page, and then there's some tabs along the top here. Hopefully you can see my mouse. Under resources for the public, there's a little tab called Speech Pathology and Justice. The full report is free to download on there. There's also lots of other information on there as well. So there's um, fact sheets and position statements and things about speech pathology and justice. And there are some a couple of short videos, um, including one from from New South Wales Youth Justice um, about the impact of speech pathology on the lives of real people who've engaged in offending behaviour. So trying to actually put it into into real example rather than it just being um, sort of hypothetical and numbers. Um, and you've got my contact details there as well if anybody would like to contact me for, for more information. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thanks, Mary. That was great. Um, we, we do have a time for one or two questions. And I've got, of course, Casey Tyler um, <laughs> Casey. <laughs> asking a, a fantastic question. So New Zealand Youth Court have access to intermediaries. If they were available for the defendants before children's court um, in Australia, what value could they add both to the child and to the criminal justice system or in justice terms professionals? Of, yeah. Casey, I'm not sure if you're asking about value as in um, qualitative or quantitative. Oh, did I say that? Quantitative? That's had a lot of syllables. Um, but in terms of, so I, I can't give a monetary um, figure on it. I do think that would be really, really interesting research. I'm sure that people, I'm sure there'll be people looking at that. Um, there's certainly, there's, uh, I know that there's a lot of value to the to the actual justice system itself in terms of enabling people to access a fair trial, um, and also potentially enabling people who might otherwise be deemed unfit to plead or um, to lack competence um it, if their communication needs are supported sometimes some of those obstacles can be overcome not in all cases but sometimes they can so then again people um are able to access the justice system and participate more effectively than they can do um i i certainly know of a few cases obviously this anecdotes but i know, certainly know of a few cases where once people have had the information explained to them in a way that is more meaningful to them they um understand the charges and they um, are able to make the decision themselves to plead guilty. And so obviously that that is a huge cost saving for the justice system. Um, 
and uh, let alone obviously it being much much fairer for for the person themselves and for the complainants um so in terms of the kind of human rights aspect of of using a communication assistant or an intermediary um in the in the justice system with the accused it's it's a no-brainer as far as i'm concerned and that certainly is the next step for the australian jurisdictions in my opinion um but i think we're a way off it unfortunately thanks mary um I think we're well. We're we're to working with you and trying to find that money. Um, and you don't you need to you. find the money, Mandy. This is the point. You don't need to find the money. Thank you. <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you for um, yeah presenting the argument well. And um, again, the the um, program organisers have done a great job because I think the next presentation leads on well from. Um, Mary's presentation there. So I'd like to welcome our next speaker is Larissa Ashton, who's a speech, um, a senior speech pathologist and Luke Francis, a senior occupational therapist in the Youth Justice Assessment and Intervention Service in South Australia. They were involved in the development of the YJAIS team and will present on tailoring interactions in response to young people's sensory and communication needs. So thanks, Larissa and Luke. No worries. Thanks, Mandy. Um, before we start, um, I just want to acknowledge that our colleagues, senior speech pathologist uh, Mel Saliva isn't able to be here with us today to help present, um, but she was part of this developing this presentation and part of the work that we're about to reference as well. Uh, so Larissa and I speak to you today from Galanatapa Youth Justice Centre on the traditional lands of the, the Ghana people uh, in Adelaide, South Australia. Um, we'd like to acknowledge the Ghana people as the custodians of the Great Adelaide region and their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Ghana people today. So um, before we dive in, uh, it's worth mentioning that our presentation was initially intended to be a 90-minute uh, workshop um, but we had to then morph into a 15 minute presentation because of the changes to the conference. So apologies for really ripping through this stuff very quickly. Uh, if people want, would like some more information, please feel free to contact us directly. Uh, so Larissa and Melissa and myself all work as part of the Youth Justice Assessment and Intervention Service or YJS, um, which is uh, made up of psychologists, myself as the OT and Sue Maney. Um, and then uh, Melissa and Larissa as the speeches. Um, so our multi D team was formed in 2019. It was uh, previously a site-specific team. Um, we're based in the Kalanatapa Youth Justice Centre. We're a statewide service, so we cover young people in the community as well as custody. Um, and our role covers assessment and intervention of disability-related uh, needs, developmental and criminogenic needs as well. Um, so back in 2019, uh, the YJ's team completed a disability screening project to determine the prevalence of disability-related needs in the custodial environment. Uh, we ended up completing about 250 assessments with 36 volunteer residents over a four-week period, and the project highlighted a number of the key findings. Um, so two of the key findings that we're going to talk about today was that around 90% uh, of the population were at risk of a language disorder and that around a third of the population had significant sensory processing needs to the point where we would expect those needs to be impacting their day-to-day -day functioning. Uh, so recommendations from that project included the development uh, of communication-friendly client-facing documentation and the development of a sensory modulation framework for the custodial environment. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the sensory processing and the sensory project and Larissa will take over and talk about um, the communication side of things. So what is sensory processing? So when we're at school, we got taught that we probably have five senses. In reality, we've actually got seven, uh, which includes vestibular um, sensations, which is related to movement and balance and proprioception, which relates to body awareness. Uh, some people might argue with you that we have an eighth sense, um, but we'll leave that argument for another day. Um, so sensory processing is essentially the ability of the brain to effectively manage the input that it receives from the body and the surrounding environment. Oops, sorry about that. Um, so 
Population therapy is a profession and sensory approach is a relatively new concept to the youth justice space. Um, sensory mod is much more well established in the mental health sector and forensic mental health sector as well. But essentially sensory modulation is a methodology whereby you can manipulate the environment to control the amount of sensory input an individual is receiving. And what the research will tell you about the benefits of sensory mod is that it's proactive rather than reactive um, in a way that it addresses behaviour. Uh, it develops independent self-regulation skills. The supportive nature of the, the methodology helps foster positive relationships. And the sensory modulation is considered a key element of best practice for the reduction of seclusion and restraint. Um, so from the lit review that we've done as part of the sensory framework project, to our knowledge, um, this is the first time that a sensory mod framework will be developed in a custodial, youth custodial specific um, setting. But the framework itself um, aimed, the primary aims are really the ones that we're actually actively trying to achieve as part of the project in terms of self-regulation and creating a responsive environment within the custodial setting. The secondary aims in terms of reducing violent incidents, uh, use of re reducing use of seclusion and restraint and improving staff safety are obviously incredibly important, but they're not explicitly being targeted through the project, but they're the things that we hope will occur if the framework is successful. So for those people who might have seen me speak yesterday, apologies for the repetition here, um, but essentially um, what I want you to do is visualise a young person carrying a backpack. Through the day, their experiences, interactions add uh, weight to that backpack. So the sensations or the, the psychological uh, impacts that happen during the days continue to fill that backpack over the day. Um, the more factors are influenced, the heavier that backpack becomes and the harder it is to carry. The harder it is to carry, the smaller the window of tolerance and the more difficult it is to self-regulate. So eventually uh, the backpack, if you don't give that young person opportunity to, to self-regulate and offload, it becomes too much to bear and it um, impacts their functioning and their ability to cope. So in terms of tailoring interactions, um, from a sensory perspective, uh, really what we're actually talking first about is the universal adaptations of environment. And a lot of the things that I'll go through quickly here are probably things that are done in a lot of places already. So I'm not trying to encourage people to reinvent the wheel. I'm just sort of coming at it from a slightly different lens. Um, so the key to tailoring interactions, as I say, through universal adaptations uh, is to first begin by making sure the physical, social and institutional environments are able to respond to individual needs of the young people. Um, so it can be the development of sensory or chill out spaces, um, the funding for reg self-regulation tools, ensuring that staff are skilled and informed about their key role in assisting the young people. So individualised approaches um, is the second stream. You've got the universal adaptations and then the individual approaches as well. Uh, everyone collects stresses at a different rate and what one person loves, another person might absolutely hate. So the things that one per helps one person to self-regulate might actually be distressing somebody else. Uh, and in terms of that analogy I used before about the backpack, everybody's backpack is different. Everyone's a different size, it fills up at different rates. So the individualised approach is absolutely critical uh, to be able to ensure that our operational procedures are flexible enough to be able to ensure that uh, each young person can have a personalised plan. And then within that individualised plan is the day-to-day -day management. Essentially, there's three points in time to intervene proactively before anything ever happens to eliminate stresses before they, it can actually impact the young person. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Early in the escalation cycle to allow the young person to offload that backpack and to self-regulate. And then also, finally, if there is an issue, if there is an escalation, then a de-escalation and crisis management uh, to intervene as well and to help that young person to to calm back down again when they're back to the baseline. So I'm going to hand over to Larissa and she'll take over from now. So Mary gave a great summary before this presentation, so I don't need to remind you that communication is an active exchange of information involving two or more people. 
Um, I think this is a really powerful quote, which reflects the experience of many young people through their experiences in the ju judicial system. Um, it's expected that just because they're told something, they've understood it. But as, many, as many people have discussed already, many young people do not have the language capabilities to be actively involved through the ju judicial process. And as Elaine McKee said this morning, she's from Talking Trouble in New Zealand, speaking is not always the only and best way to communicate. Um, so here we have a timeline prompting us to think about all of the communication experiences a young person might have through their journey with the justice system. Um, so interactions with police, solicitors and the court um, often involve interviews, telling their story, understanding complex legal jargon. Um, and then while they're under youth justice supervision, they may have to understand complex mandate obligations, such as the rules of electronic curfew monitoring or understanding the routines and expectations of them while they're in custody. And they're likely to participate in supervision and often language heavy rehabilitative or cr criminogenic interventions. So what is the experience of the young person with communication challenges through these processes? They hear a whole lot of talking and they may not be able to engage with them. Um, but we can see that there are many opportunities to enhance young people's access to important written and verbal information. Um, I won't go over this um, very much because Mary has done a wonderful summary before us, but we know that there's a high incidence of communication difficulties around the world. Um, and when we speak about language disorder, we're talking about permanent and lifelong difficulties in talking and understanding language, which can include written language and spoken language. However, it's not just language disorder that can limit a young person's ability to access written and verbal information. So many young people have involved in youth justice have many other factors at play, which I'm sure you're all too familiar with. Um, so our knowledge of young people's language processing abilities, coupled with the high language demands in the judicial system, led us to de the development of the Enhancing Communication Accessibility Project. So the key objective of the project is to improve young people's access to and an understanding of important information by transforming documents into an easy to understand format. Um, and in a moment, I'm going to show you some of them. Um, so to ensure sustainability, we're also developing a guideline, providing staff training and creating a toolbox of templates for staff to draw upon. Um, so while the project's currently underway, we're currently creating documents and seeking feedback. So that's the section in the middle, the um, dark blue section. Um, and we're seeking feedback from staff, cultural advisors, and most importantly, the young people who are the primary audience. Um, so let's have a look at some documents. Here's an example of the uh, de density and complexity of language that's used in a bail agreement document. So we've de-identified this, which explains the white boxes on it. Um, but you can imagine that um, there's a lot of demands on a young person's language system to understand this. We'll have a bit of a closer look at one of the conditions. So you can see that this information is not presented in a way that is at all accessible to many young people. And so these are some of the problems that we see with this. Um, so as stated earlier, the aim of the project is to make documents more accessible. So we chose to adopt the easy English method, which was designed by a speech pathologist from Australia called Cathy Basterfield. So the main idea of this framework is that complex information is simplified by using simple vocabulary, short sentences, and there's a higher picture to words ratio. So let's have a look at some examples of some of the documents that we've drafted. Um, so here's an example of the bail conditions, which have been modified into the easy English version. Um, so you can see that it's a lot more simple. The language is, um, is more, short and concise, and there's lots of images. Um, we've consulted with about 10 young people as well as staff on these, and we'll be doing um, cultural consultations shortly. Um, here's our auth authority to release information form um, to consent young people to share information with other agencies. Um, and here's the modified version that we've created. Um, it's important that young people are informed about changes and objectives in the organisation. So our Youth Justice State Plan is a 44-page document, but here's a youth-friendly version that we've created. 
Um, often we find that young people um, breach conditions when they're under electronic monitoring. Um, so this document is an example which has really helped staff to communicate with young people exactly what is expected of them when they're under electronic monitoring. Um, so looking quickly at some of the successes, um, staff have been modifying a lot of their own communication and really engaging with speech pathology. Um, we've seen a lot of improvements for young people as well. And just quickly, here are some quotes for some young people um, that they mentioned during their consultations. Um, so what do we want to achieve from both projects? We acknowledge that it's complex to meet a youth justice services organisational demands while responding dynamically and innovatively to young people's needs also. We want to embed sensory and communication responsive services as part of our day-to-day -day practice, as we do with other concepts such as trauma-informed and culturally informed care. If we do this, we can ensure that youth justice systems are responsive to young people's needs. So what's the result and outcome? Improved compliance, behaviour, functioning, and the ultimate goal, reduce recidivism. Um, and here's some references. Thank you for listening. That was fantastic. Thank you, um, both Larissa and Luke. Very, I know you've you've cut down your workshop to um, 15 <laughs> minutes or, or 16 minutes, but um, I think we got a lot of information there. There's a couple of questions. So um, one question is, do you use any Indigenous sensory modulation strategies? Um, to be honest, um, there is a very much a dearth of uh, cultural specific um, sensory related research out there. Um, so the sensory project itself is being developed in conjunction with two academics, um, Dr. Ben Seller and Dr. Scott Weeks from the University of South Australia. Um, and from the literature review that we've done, we've found next to nothing related to um, whether Indigenous people um, experience sensory processing in any particularly different way to non-Indigenous um, and any sort of in cultural specific mechanisms. Um, so built into our project, we've got a lot of cultural consultation. We're actually at the point now where we're just about to start actually developing the framework itself um, and so built into that process there was um, some cultural consultation with um, cultural stakeholders but also young people as well and we've had a youth engagement process throughout the process as well in which uh, we've engaged young people from around 50 percent of the people that we've engaged so far have been from an aboriginal background as well um, so that doesn't specifically answer the question um, but as I say, um, if anybody is aware of any research that's out there in that space, please feel free to email me because I'd love to see it. Thanks, Luke. Um, and did you experience any workplace pushback when introducing the interventions and how do you overcome this change management process? I think, as Luke mentioned, we've been in the service for nearly three years now. Um, and so I think it's, we've been able to take a really capacity building step-by-step -step approach. So, and because our roles are also clinical as well, we've been working closely with staff regarding specific clients. So we're able to provide some of these strategies such as communication and sensory enhancement in relation to specific clients. And I think staff can see the benefit and then that's helps them to see the possibilities and what else we can do for the service. Yeah, and I'd probably second that as well, that, I mean, change is always difficult and you always get a bit of pushback with regards to change. But as on the whole, I think that the staff here have been supportive. If we can show that the reasons of why we're, we're offering something different, and as Larissa said, often that's through working alongside of people, then more often than not, people are on board and they completely understand why we're doing it. And from a sensory perspective, people, the operational staff see sensory related needs every single day. They may not realise it, but once it's explained to them, they're 100% on board. So they've been completely supportive all the way through, mm. really. Yeah, great. No, that's right. Doesn't it? With uh, 
change when people can see how it improves their work as well yeah, as those absolutely. of the young people so outcomes. Um, so there, there is just one last question, but I, I'm assuming uh, there's a lot of people who uh, may be interested in being able to access copies of the easy read versions that you have. Are you happy to share those? Um, so we're still finalising them. So I, I didn't get to mention, but we're still finalising changes based on young people feedback and then um, conducting cultural consultations in a few weeks. But certainly when they're finalised, I'd love to share them wider and I'd love to see it be something that's happening across Australia and New Zealand as well. Great. Well, thank you both. Um, I appreciate your time and, and being flexible to adjust your, your workshop. No problem. Thanks. Thanks so now much. we're thank you. We're now we're on to our final speaker for the day. Okay. Um it looks like our fourth speaker just before he was about to present has had some technical issues. So um we just need to um yeah we'll get back to you very soon. Great. Okay. So I think um, he's on his way back in. So while while he's getting connected, I will I will um, give you his um, bio. So Dr. Lucas Ferreira is a research fellow in the Justice Health Unit. Centre for Health Equity and the Centre for Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the Melbourne School of Population Health at um, Melbourne University. Well, that's a mouthful, but there's still more. He's also a research fellow at the Centre for Adolescent Health Murder Institute. And he is just about to join us to present on non communicable disease multi morbidity and mortality among justice involved young people a data linkage study that's a whole mouthful your intro lucas so welcome uh thanks very much amanda and apologies for the mouthful uh, i'm very happy to be presenting this work actually uh led within the justice health unit university of melbourne and the uh, center for adolescent health and mcri um, before I go ahead, I'd like to start with the uh, acknowledgement of country. So I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people from the Kulin Nation, the uh, traditional custodians of the land where I'm speaking from today, and uh, pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and extend um, my respect to all First Nations people attending today. Uh, very quick di uh, disclaimer here. So this presentation does not reflect the opinions of Youth Justice Queensland or any other data custodian related to the data here presented. Um, and please uh, refrain from sharing these results because they haven't been published yet, so they're quite fresh. And um, finally, just like to acknowledge that uh, I'm going to be presenting some mortality statistics um, here uh, about young people in, from an already disadvantaged uh, cohort, but we do hope that. Uh, the data and the evidence that I'll present might, you know, uh, start some ideas for prevention and improvement. Uh, a bit of background, um, young people in detention settings, uh, as you probably already know, are disproportionately affected by preventable morbidity and mortality. And uh, while that's caused by external factors such as uh, injury, violence, substance misuse, and suicide are more common, there's still a considerable burden uh, in terms of physical and mental illness. Uh, and that's caused by non-communicable diseases and not being adequately characterizing people with a history uh, of contact with the justice system. So to our knowledge, this is uh, the first time this sort of data is presented. Um, and for the reasons I just uh, described, uh, Professor Stuart Kinner and colleagues uh, established the uh, Youth Justice Mortality Study, the YG Mort Study. And uh, the aims were first to describe the incidents, uh, timing, causes, context, and risk factors uh, from uh, mortality in young Indigenous and non-Indigenous people who had contact with the youth justice system in Queensland. 
and for that, uh, inform targeted prevention policy reform by identifying uh, some of the modifiable risk factors, health mobilities, uh, and service contexts in this cohort. But finally, uh, to identify specific interventions uh, and policy reforms that have the potential to reduce mortality uh, in this cohort. Uh, so this is a retrospective uh, data linkage cohort study of all young people um, aged uh, 18 years or under who had contact with the youth justice system in Queensland from 93 to 2014. Um, here today, I'm gonna be describing uh, some incidents of all causes that or cause deaths first. Um, and then I'm um, gonna be comparing the incidence to similar age and sex groups in the general Australian population. Um, then we're gonna go and actually describe deaths caused by NCDs and discuss a bit of the methods we use to uh, do that. Uh, and NCDs here cause, uh, as an underlying cause of death. And finally, uh, to identify risk factors for those NCD deaths. Uh, this is an overview of the data linkage uh, process. Uh, the youth justice records uh, from Youth Justice Queensland uh, were used as a sampling frame in the study and were then linked to adult prison records, uh, death records from the, the National uh, Death Index, and coronial records from the uh, National Information System. Uh, so uh, the final uh, case files you can see here had data from all these four sources that were uh, linked using a unique ICMS identifier. These are some of the uh, characteristics of the sample. This um, study had nearly 50,000 young people. Uh, the majority uh, of them were males, around 76% and 24% of females. Uh, Around 27% were indigenous and around 73% non-indigenous. The majority uh, were only charged, uh, followed by those uh, who received an order without detention, around 27%, and uh, nearly 16% experienced at least one episode of detention. And here you can see that while the majority had their first contact with the justice system, when they were age 14 years or older, they still were considerable amount, nearly 14% had that first contact under 14 years of age. So in this first part of the uh, descriptive statistics, um, this was done using uh, classifying uh, death records in terms of their underlying causes of death using the ICD chapters, the International Classification of Diseases. And then we estimated crude mortality rates per 100,000 person years. And our standardized mortality ratios were actually uh, comparisons of the rates found in our study to rates found in the Australian population using the green books from the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. And those were then standardized by sex and age using the base year of 2015. And there will be some uh, stratifications by sex, youth justice history, and indigenous status. So with that out of the way, uh, here goes some of the uh, preliminary results. Uh, this again, just to, to clarify, these are ICD chapters in criminal target rates per 100,000 person years. Uh, in this study, we observed a, a total of 1,431 deaths. And I highlighted here some of the top causes using the ICD, ICD classifications. Um, the, the majority of deaths were still caused by external uh, deaths, as I mentioned before. But then there are some categories here, such as uh, neoplasms, mental disorders, nervous disorders and circulatory disorders that actually had considerable uh, rates of mortality. And um, a caveat here in terms of the mental disorders, um, a lot of those, because of the use of ICD chapters to classify those, a lot of those end up being uh, caused by uh, injuries or external causes. But then I'm gonna be speaking about some of the other methods we use to classify and understand a little bit better the, the causes of death in this cohort. Um, these again, using ICD chapters, these are the standardized mortality ratios by sex. Um, and just to uh, further clarify here, what the SMRs tell us is um, a ratio comparing the rates we find in our study in those groups to um, comparable groups in the Australian population in terms of age and sex. And uh, in terms of all causes of death here, we can um, identify a, a significant difference between females and males. Uh, females nearly six times um, uh, at higher uh, 
odds of uh, experiencing a, a NCD or sorry, a whole cause death compared to around four for males. So these, these are ratios comparing to the general population. You can see that um, even without this stratification, this cohort still experiences um, much higher rates than the general population. And um, I highlighted here respiratory system disorders because it's out of those um, subclassifications is one that we can confidently say uh, that uh, males and females were different based on the confidence intervals not overlapping. So females with nearly seven times higher rates of um, uh, respiratory system disorders as a cause of death um, compared to the general population. Uh, these are again uh, ratios uh, now by just self history. Um, I'm not going to go into much detail in these specific groups here, but in terms of all causes, we can again uh, confidently uh, identify uh, differences between those groups. First with uh, the group that was only charged around uh, 3.56, but then it climbs uh, up to 4.50 for those uh, who received the order without detention and nearly seven times higher rates for those who experienced detention. So we, from that, so from those results, we can see um, uh, sort of confirms so, sort of the knowledge that how this adventure this cohort is uh, when it comes to all causes mortality um, compared to the general population. But since our main objective here is to look at non-communicable causes of disease, um, unfortunately ICD chapters are not the best method to do that because a lot of those categories end up including both communicable and non-communicable diseases. Um, so for that reason we use the global burden of disease uh, categories. Uh, which basically um, stratifies uh, death records into those caused by injuries, uh, those caused by communicable diseases, and then non communicable diseases. So you can see here the categories that we use to classify uh, those deaths. And in our study, we did not observe any deaths caused by skin and subcutaneous causes uh, or sense organ diseases, but all the other uh, categories uh, still stand. Um, these are some preliminary results. Again, these are crude mortality rates by indigenous status using the global burden of disease categories. So when you look at all uh, NCD causes, all those groups cause, uh, grouped together, um, we see that the rates between indigenous and non-indigenous can be quite similar uh, with a rate of around uh, 20 here uh, uh, per 100,000 person years. But then when looking at the cause specific um, um, groups here in terms of neoplasmas and cardiovascular disease, we see a, a difference here between those two groups with uh, non-indigenous with higher rates of neoplasms and indigenous with higher rates of cardiovascular disease. And just uh, need to clarify here that because the counts um, in our study were very small, uh, uh, in this young cohort, so we don't, uh, the confidence intervals overlap, uh, so we probably need a, a larger sample size to more confidently detect differences between those groups. Um, but nonetheless, um, these are the results we found, and uh, by using those categories, we found 133 uh, deaths caused by NCD, again as an underlying cause of death uh, in this cohort. In terms of comorbidities, um, 70% of those who died from an NCD as an underlying cause had at least one NCD comorbidity at time of death. Um, and nearly 10% um, uh, of, the, of everyone who died from an NCD had complex multimorbidity, which we're defining here as having three or more morbidities in total. So you can see that um, uh, this group actually it does offer some possibilities for prevention, especially in the context of multimorbidities. And in terms of the, um, the, whole, the whole group of deaths, uh, 1,431, nearly 8% of those had at least one NCD as a contributing cause. But um, there's some hypotheses uh, that we came up with in terms of why this number is a bit small. And, and it it's, uh, comes to uh, how these deaths are ascertained, and especially uh, for uh, injuries and external deaths ascertained by coroner reports, which can be different if they're ascertained by a physician. Uh, which is more the case for NCDs. Um, finally, I'm just going to go quickly through the survival analysis using Cox proportional hazards model. We relax the, uh, the hazard assumption by using 10 Brian Covarrets, Youth Justice History and Legal Status. And this is a, a busy slide. So 
uh, these actually, it's probably the exposure that we're interested in. So the detention group here had, had nearly 80% uh, higher um, uh, risk of, of NCD death compared to the charge without other baseline group. And that's when we have adjusted for all these other covariates in the model legal status, age at first contact, sex and region status. Uh, some caveats for interpretation. So the standardized mortality ratios, they need to be analyzed in conjunction with the rates, especially in this cohort that has uh, uh, small absolute counts and small absolute risks, uh, still uh, relevant nonetheless. Uh, confidence intervals, they overlap again because of the sample size, so it's not um, sometimes not enough to detect statistical differences between those groups. And uh, more importantly, the association that we find between detention or that group that uh, experience at least one episode of detention and the increased risk in terms of NCD deaths that does not necessarily imply causation, but it does offer a valuable um, window in terms of risk stratification and potential for prevention. Some reflections here, uh, more questions really, how to reconcile those findings for, with the translational pathways what those results mean for young just involved people. And again, I think it, it, it passes um, through the possibilities of prevention when they're released uh, from prison, especially given uh, uh, those rates uh, being nearly seven times higher than the general population. And uh, also understand the limitations of the information, including in death records, that's not a, um, only a snapshot of, where, uh, of information about the, the health, of uh, young uh, justice involved people, but, um, but for that reason, we're conducting some new studies using um, hospital admissions and other kinds of information that can be helpful. Um, I just would like to acknowledge my colleagues uh, and the support in the study, uh, Youth Justice Queensland and the other data custodians, and I thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Lucas. Just, um, we've only got a few minutes to go into the, the wrap up. So, um, so just one question in the, in a couple of minutes, what, what's one recommendation you would provide um, youth justice agencies to uh, respond to the results of the study? Yeah, it's a, thanks for the question. I mean, it's a challenging one, of course. I Based not only on these results, but some other studies that we have conducted, they show that, um, when, when released uh, from detention, um, not only young people, but all, like older people as well, are at high risk, especially if, in terms of the uptake of use of healthcare services. So um, one thing I think that could be worth a little bit more is a bit more information for young people in terms of how to access those healthcare services when they're released. And, and a bit of information about um, a risk as well to, for, for understanding, not just in terms of uh, causes like uh, external causes, violence and suicide, but also information about the non-communicable diseases. And I'm sure young people uh, probably don't see that as a, as a huge problem, given there's so many other problems that might, and disadvantages might be in place. But it is, um, I think, a window for communicating with young people a little bit better before release um, in terms of how they could access those services. I think it could be a, a good starting point. Great. Well, there you go. It was a tough question, but you answered it um, very well. So thank you, Lucas. Look, we don't have any other questions, and I, I'm um, very happy to be the facilitator who ends on time and gets everybody to the, the wrap-up um, session for the end of a, another fantastic day of the conference. So um, thank you, Lucas, and thank you, everyone else um, presenting in the session. And if you'd all just go back now to your timeline and um, for the quick wrap up of day two. Thanks, everyone.